Hi, this is Dr. Pat Rush from THEN, the Center for Collaborative Study of Trauma, Health Equity, and Neurobiology. Today we will study an introduction to brain networks. Our topics will include our best way to evaluate the brain. We will look at different scientific models, the reductionist fragmented model versus the unified dynamic model. Second, we will review a new paradigm from the 1990s of brain networks. We will look at various imaging techniques, particularly the functional MRI, the fMRI, which uses dynamic bold signaling. Lastly, we will rethink physical and emotional health using the lens of brain networks and connectivity. What do we think is the best method to evaluate brain function? A key problem for all medical science is that our scientific model of health is fragmented. Starting in the mid 19th century, medicine adopted an approach called reductionism. This approach is almost invisible in our current medical system, but underlies all kinds of decisions about how we see the body, the parts of the body and disease. Using reductionism, the brain is seen as separate from the rest of the body. And the body itself is seen as a collection of different organ system parts. In some ways, reductionism has been very successful because it has allowed doctors and patients to focus on parts of the, their body and disease. However, reductionism prevents us from seeing factors that influence the whole brain and body and prevents us from understanding pathogenesis, how diseases occur and why people might have one more than one disease at the same time. The system of reductionism, dividing things into smaller and smaller parts has also been applied to the brain. We see in this diagram, a cross section of the brain with all kinds of different areas being labeled and colored. So for example, we see the cortex, which has previously been thought of mostly as the thinking part of the brain. And we see lower levels of the brain, such as the cerebellum, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala. The problem is this model is out of date. Another problem is that reductionist analysis has been extended down to smaller and smaller parts of the brain. On the left-hand side, you see a diagram of a single nerve cell, a neuron, and the body of the neuron, and then the dendrites receiving signals and axons sending out signals. On the right-hand side, you see a diagram of a synapse. This is the connection between one neuron and the next. You see on the sending neuron on the top, little circles with um, which contain molecules of what is called a neurotransmitter, something that will activate the receiving or bottom neuron, which is in green. All of these diagrams are accurate, they are true, but they only tell us part of the story. It is time to rethink clinical neurobiology and psychiatry. And there are physicians and scientists throughout the world who are working on this right now. One question is, is this really how the brain and body works? Is the brain just a mass of individual neurons and synapses? And are the, is the brain also just a bunch of individual parts? 
Why is this significant? All current mainstream psychopharmacology, the prescribing of medication for emotional or behavioral disorders is based on this model. The idea is to modify specific neurotransmitters at the synaptic level. Our question is, is this the best treatment approach? The new medical model is understanding that the brain and body are not just connected, they are a unified system. This is also the ancient model. This is the model of common sense. We can all see that our mind and our body are integrally connected. But through reductionist science, doctors and um, all other providers have been taught to think of the body as being a disconnected collection. Starting in the 1990s, a new model of brain function developed and it was labeled networks. Rather than using a model of individual brain parts, each doing only one category of task, such as areas of brain involved in vision or movement or thinking, scientists began to ask what if brain areas were synchronized with other brain areas in order to accomplish complex tasks. A key concept is connectivity. This is defined as the integrated synchronized function among spatially distant brain areas. So for example, in this image on the right, we see that when activated at the same time, the front area of the brain at the top and the central midline area toward the bottom and two side areas are all lighting up at the same time. They are synchronized. This poses a problem for the um, usual model of the brain because these areas that work together, synchronize together, are not hired wired. There is no neuron to neuron synapse connecting them. The other important part of connectivity is the ability of brain networks to quickly and smoothly switch from one state or task. So each task appears to have its own dedicated brain network and it can switch back and forth with other networks to accomplish complex tasks. Why is this revolution in brain science happening now? First of all, as all of us know, in the past 30 years, there have been a tremendous increase in computing power, which has enabled new technology. At the same time, there have been advances in network science theory and a growing global community of neuroscientists and system scientists. Let's take a moment for a brief recap of imaging, how we see inside the body. In 1895, Röntgen discovered x-rays could pass through tissue capturing an image on film. In the upper left-hand corner, you have an example of what's called a plain x-ray of a skull. In other words, the patient is laying on the table and a picture is taken from the side and we can see the bones of the skull, the spine, the jaw, the teeth. Plain x-rays are great for visualizing bones, but not so great for soft tissue. Therefore, for the first half of the 20th century, radiologists tried to figure out how can we see inside. In the 1950s, tomography was developed. Tomography means a cross-sectional slice. And we see on the left-hand side at the bottom, three images, three slices, first of 
up above is the base of the brain. You can see um, part of the sinuses on the lower face, on the upper face, the lower skull, and you can see the person's eyes. The second image is at a higher cross section. You can see the um, brain and different um, ventricles holding fluid inside the brain. And on the top image, on the farthest bottom image, you see the top of the brain. Using tomography allowed radiologists and physicians to organize the pictures of the slices to reconstruct tissue culture, tissue structure. In the 1970s, there were multiple um, advances. We're going to review briefly the CT scan, the MRI, and the functional MRI. The CT scan was developed in 1972. By this point, uh, computer technology had improved to the point where radiologists were able to do a three-dimensional reconstruction of the brain and also of the abdomen and chest by looking at images taken at different angles. In 1980s, the next step was development of the MRI using magnetic resonance, which was like a CT scan, but more versatile. So we've gone from taking plain images of the bones to being able to do tomographs, slices of the organs, and reconstructing them. The next image, the next step was the development of essentially video technology. This was called the functional MRI and was developed in 1990 by Dr. Ogawa, a scientist at the AT&T Bell Labs in the United States. Ogawa and his colleagues figured out that oxygenated hemoglobin, in other words, blood containing oxygen, a higher level of oxygen, would have a different MRI signal than hemoglobin that had lost its oxygen. The theory was that an active neuron requires instantaneous influx of oxygen and glucose. The oxygenated hemoglobin causes the image to light up. We see in the picture on the right-hand side, the image of a person's brain and the activated areas have been artificially colored with yellow, showing the back of the brain and also two centers in the midbrain, which have light, lit up. This is called BOLD, B-O-L-D, blood oxygenated level dependent imaging. By capturing and then reconstructing the continuous signal variation of the brain, the fMRI essentially creates a video of the brain's changing function as it performs different tasks. Scientists have identified several consistent patterns of brain activation, which they've labeled networks, which are elicited when a subject performs standardized tasks. For thinking and emotions, there are three main networks, the default mode network, the salience network, and the sec central executive network. These, as you can see, have all been discovered within the past 20 years. The fMRI allows detection of brain networks, but requires that the person being scanned follows standardized tasks or exposures. That way that same network will always light up. In the image in the right, we see a woman with her head inside a tube that is going to go into the fMRI machine. Above her head, is a little like card 
where um, the scientist can project a particular image or a particular task. So the first task is always to evaluate the patient in the resting state. The instructions to the person are to stay awake, but quiet, not focused on a particular task. Scientists have determined that there are consistent areas which activate, which have been designated the default mode network. The second standardized evaluation is of the task solving state. This time the person is instructed to stay awake, but given a specific task to solve, perhaps to solve a simple math problem. Again, we will see that consistently certain brain areas light up and these have been designated as the central executive network. Let's look in more detail. The default mode network, again, is the resting state where the person having the scan is awake, but quiet. It allows the person being scanned to daydream and reflect. Over the past 15 years, scientists have identified that the default mode network is involved in the neurologic basis for the sense of self. It allows us to recall memories and facts about ourselves, to think about our own emotions, and to think about ourselves across time. Think about the past and into the future. The default mode network also allows us to think about others, their emotions, and their actions. It allows us to understand stories and appreciate beauty. The central executive network, also called CEN or ECN or frontal parietal network, is activated by goal-oriented cognitively demanding tasks. It allows us to consider complex information, making decisions, and integrate sensory information. The CEN is also involved <coughs> in emotional regulation. Let's take a moment to reflect. How do we imagine that the brain decides when to stay awake or at rest and when to switch from daydreaming to thinking about a task? and how to choose a particular task among many options. For example, if you're awake in the morning in bed and still resting, but kind of daydreaming, how could you choose among these tasks? Getting up and taking a shower, taking the dog out to walk, checking your email, getting your kids ready to go to school, how would you choose these different, among these different tasks versus just staying in bed and daydreaming? The brain has another network called the salience network. Salience means judging importance or relevance of any choice. It was, cho it was named this by scientists in the past 10 years because they noticed that when the brain is switching, from default mode to executive mode, it goes through a medium stage, which they named the salience network. The salience network allows us to integrate emotional, sensory, and cognitive stimuli, and it's involved in social behavior, communication, and self-awareness. Social behavior means being able to get along well with others. Salience, again, means noticing what is important or relevant. So in the diagram on the right, we see the default mode network on the left, 
the executive network on the right and the salience network in between, which mediates between switching back and forth. <clears throat> Let's take a moment to reflect. With a history of severe trauma, how easy do we think it would be for the salience network to, to work, to be able to judge safety versus threat? And how do we think that dysregulation of the salience network would affect the ability to switch back and forth? Part three, understanding brain network connectivity and its application to emotional, mental, and physical health. Let's take a minute for reflection. Can you think of three experience or factors which might promote formation and coordination of brain networks? Research has shown that the greatest growth and coordination of brain networks occurs from the third trimester of pregnancy through the first three months of life. If the salience network is not working, what medical and psychiatric diagnosis might result. One of the most important processes in our lives to build brain networks is the child and caregiver relationship with attunement and attachment. In this diagram, we see the father holding the baby. And you will notice that both of them are, have the same facial image. They both look happy and they both have their mouths open. We can imagine that the father probably opened his mouth and the baby mirrored, but it's possible it could have been the baby first. On the left, you see the cycle of attunement and attachment. One of the pair, usually the baby, expresses a feeling or need. The parent notices and understands what the baby is looking for and responds. And then the baby experiences the parental response and also responds. So you have this serve and respond cycle of one reaches out, the other reaches out, the one smiles, the other smiles, etc. Or the baby cries and the parent comforts it. That back and forth process, which happens thousands of times a day with a parent and child, is what forms that brain network. It also forms the sense of safety. Other processes that build connectivity by activating the inborn regulatory processes are a daily routine of activities and emotional regulation through re relationships. Believe it or not, getting up awakening and going to bed at the same time are crucial for the formation of brain networks and um, emotional physical health. Having activities and meals at the same time and through relationships, spending time with others, doing homework together and enjoying relaxing activities. Let's look at the other side of things. Can you think of three experiences or factors which might be associated with dysregulated brain networks? Let's look at these two images and compare a person with no history of severe trauma to a person with PTSD. On the left, we see the brain during the the default mode so that we see that the brain on the left is quiet. When we look at the right for the person with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, we can see 
that the brain, many areas of the brain are activated. Therefore, the poor person with PTSD has, is not able to rest, is not able to um, assess uh, and reflect on their own emotional health, on the emotional uh, and social activities of others. So let's think again about the salience network. If the salience network is dysregulated, if needed brain areas are not synchronized, or if it takes a long time for the network to decide what is salient, how would this look clinically? And what would a patient experience be? Research has shown that dysfunction of the salience network is associated with many of our most severe emotional and behavioral problems. The salience network integrates sensory information from outside and within the body. On the left-hand side, you see this diagram of the eight senses, smell, sight, taste, hearing, balance, proprioception, knowing where you are in space and touch. It also integrates on the right side, interoception, a sense that helps you feel what's going on in your own body. Here we see um, stomach problems, breathing problems, bladder problems, maybe palpitations, racing heart rate, and painful rash. So the salience network integrates all these different systems. If the salience network is dysregulated, then this has been found in patients with anxiety, depression, eating disorders, borderline personality, which is essentially an attachment disorder, attention deficit, autism, bipolar disorder, and substance abuse and psychosis. Can the brain reprogram its networks and connectivity? Yes. What is neuroplasticity? It's the ability of the brain to reorganize and form new connections, especially in response to learning or, the, or experience. We have to remember that just because a person had severe trauma, it does not doom them to dysregulated brain networks. The outcome of brain function and health depends on a balance between stressors and supports. Brain networks can be reprogrammed. Things that have been shown to make a difference are relationships, rhythmic activity, mindfulness, which is to retrain the body in noticing small things. Also processing trauma, decreasing fear with increasing tolerance of traumatic triggers. One therapy here is EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprogramming. Also neurofeedback has been very helpful. And in the past few years, research has demonstrated the value of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Let's take a minute and look at some answers for the previous reflection questions. Can we think of three experiences and factors which affect formation and coordination of brain networks? One is the length of pregnancy, full term versus premature, remembering that the most sensitive portion of brain development, brain network development is the last trimester of pregnancy and the first three months of the baby's life. Therefore, mother and fetal experiences during pregnancy also have an impact. We also can look at neonatal parent-child attunement and attachment 
in the first three months, the daily routine of sleep, family activities, and fun, and also the sense of safety and attunement and attachment throughout childhood. Can we think of three experiences <clears throat> or factors associated with dysregulated brain networks? Again, premature birth and pregnancy complications, deprivation of early parent-child attunement and attachment, especially in the first few months, growing up in a chaotic home environment with no routine or inadequate sleep, and also trauma in all of its varieties. What's next? What happened to our idea about the unified brain and body? Has this been applied to brain network research? Yes. What scientists have found out is, is that there are also brain networks which support function of all the different body parts as well as integrate the brain and body. Here's a 2021 paper from Dr. Jafari and colleagues from Washington, Minnesota and Harvard. Believe it or not, they chose to look at the association of chronic sinus nasal inflammation with brain connectivity. What did they find? Patients with chronic sinusitis as compared to controls were found to have abnormal brain connectivity and the severity of sinus inflammation correlated with the magnitude of abnormal connectivity. In other words, it was dose dependent, which is felt to be a very important research finding. The larger the dysregulation of the brain networks, the more severe of the chronic sinus inflammation. So our next question is will improving brain connectivity improve inflammation? And scientists around the world are studying this right now. We expect that over the next 10 years, the relationship of brain networks and integrated brain body regulation will be found to be very important in the pathogenesis and treatment of disease. This is the science of the 21st century. Thank you.